before the Bible was available in every house in a language that everybody could understand, artists like Michelangelo shared God's word visually through uh, sculpture and paint. The walls and ceilings of churches used to be covered with pictures telling the great story of God and the redemption of humankind. The ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican City is considered to be one of the greatest artistic endeavors of humanity ever. And the centerpiece of that is a story from Genesis, the creation of Adam. So on one side, Adam kind of reclines, looking at God. But on the other side, God is urgently reaching out to Adam, trying to infuse Adam with life. Fingers, the hands, the two hands capture my attention. God's fingers are outstretched, but Adam kind of feebly reaches back as if to say, yeah, I want that, well, maybe, no, maybe later. Author Tom Berlin calls the space between the fingers the almost of life. It is what we would have and what we could be if we could just reach out to God with the enthusiasm at, that God reaches out to us. He writes the gap between them is the life that we have and the life that we want. It is the empty space in our relationship with God, that we feel, even as we desire to commune with the one that creates us. Other than posture, the two figures are remarkably similar. Both are beautiful and strong and well-formed, depicting God's intention to create humankind in God's image reflecting God's nature. Look at the person next to you. Well, I really mean it. Look at the person next to you. The spirit of our creator is stamped into each and every one of you, into each and every one of us. Not that we are God, but we are made in the image of God. We are children of God. God's goodness is part of our identity. When we stand to pass the peace on a Sunday morning, it's a reminder that God's goodness is in us and we're just so full of joy that we want to hug and shake hands. But at other times, when we look at our neighbors, we miss seeing that goodness entirely. Because people are a mess. You and I are a mess. I don't think there's one person here today or one person listening that has everything in their life together. And those that appear to have it all together, they have inner turmoil that they keep to themselves. Now, granted, some of us are a mess, not because of anything that we did. We, we don't control cancer. We can't stop a hurricane from ruining our homes. But others, others have created their own mess. Maxed out credit cards with high interest rates. People who have a really hard time being on top of their own needs running to work, and so the speeding tickets are piling up. Those of us who burn the candle at both ends and find anger smoldering in the middle to the point that all of our relationships that we need and depend on are fried. In our competitive society, we tend to hide our mess. We try to sweep it under the rug or disguise, disguise it. Think about Facebook posts or those seasonal letters that we write. Everyone's life looks so perfect. It's hard to acknowledge that we are not as wonderful as we think we are. Preachers have a word for this mess.
call it sin. Now when I say sin, what do you think of? Certainly moral favor, failures like anger, abuse, or adultery, that's a start. But it also happens on a social scale, like when factories release their waste into new nearby rivers, polluting them. Or when certain people are limited to where they live because of their race. And then there are sins of omission, sins that are caused by inaction. Like when we spend our time filming an assault instead of using that phone to call for help or when we simply step over someone who really needs assistance. Sin is easier to recognize than somebody else. Think, picture this. Two little girls jumping on a couch. You know how much fun that is? And what does mom say? Stop jumping. It's not good for the couch. And furthermore, you're going to fall off and hurt yourself. And so those kids obey, they get off the couch, they're playing on the floor with their toys, but you know how hard it is to resist? And before you know it, they're both jumping up and down on that couch again. And as they are doing that, springing up and down and up and down, the one looks at the other, points and says, Mommy, look what she's doing. <laughs> it's easier to call out and see faults in others. In the late 80s, the frescoes of the Sistine Chapel were restored. 500 years of candle smoke, humidity, uh, dust, pollution, the grime of of thousands of people visiting the Sistine Chapel every week had muted the colors. In fact, there was so much grime on those pictures, they, they were almost monochrome. The Vatican exhibits showing the before and after photos of the restoration are astonishing, and it makes you truly appreciate the gentle work required to restore the splendor colors of those original images. Our sin is like a thick layer of grime that covers and dulls the image of God's goodness that's within each of us. It's hard to hold on to these two truths. First, that we are created in God's image. That means that we are greater masterpieces than any art that Michelangelo left on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And that the grime of sin covers us and hides the great beauty that God intended for us and the world to enjoy. Uh, some people struggle to believe that any of God's goodness is inside of them because they've just been so hurt by life that their self-worth is pretty much non-existent. And other people struggle to believe that they need change. They don't acknowledge the crime. I'm not that bad. I'm not an axe murderer. This is who I am. Just get over it. We aren't alone in our struggles. It's not just for us to try harder and harder to be better. God is actively reaching out for us, trying to infuse us with the true life. It is God's grace working through the people and the events in our life that awakens us to the grime and then gives us hope that God's goodness can be fully restored within us. If you're there thinking, God, where are you? Don't leave me in this mess. The restoration has already begun because you have acknowledged that you need God. God's grace is not going to overpower us. He just offers it to us. We have to accept 
accept it. We have to surrender to Christ's alignment. And the scraping away of grime and the restoration of our true colors. And with the Holy Spirit, we begin this really long, lifelong journey to learn to live more fully and act with love. The goal is to accept God's gift of abundant life, to learn to live and love like Jesus. We call it being a disciple of Christ. It is a way of living that lets your true colors glow. Discipleship is a way of nurturing or maturing into the person that God made you to be. Again, we don't do this alone. We do it with others from this congregation. We are better together. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of the life. We become whole, complete, healthy, holy, when we respond to God and reach out to close that gap between God and ourselves. And then having received the gift of such a powerful, transformative love, how could we not share it? The church, our congregation, each one of us working together as agents of God's love, as disciples of Christ, is the community where others can come to know and love and serve God. The why of the Great Commission is to go and make disciples. The purpose of us being here today is to make disciples. The how is the way we do it with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. It is the things that we do as a congregation. Some of us show God's love through prayer. You know, we pray for the newborn babies that came into this world on Friday, and we pray, we open our hearts to carry the grief of those that lost a loved one this week, those that passed from our embrace to God's eternal loving embrace. And we pray for every moment in between. Some of us have the gift of teaching, and we delight in working in the nursery or in the Sunday school classroom. Or we have the gift of music so that we can deepen worship. And some of us put God's love into action by donating hygiene articles that will be packaged for people without homes. Or we make cards that our troops overseas will send home to loved ones at Christmas. Or we barbecue pork, beef, and chicken to share the gospel one bite at a time. Or we fill shoeboxes with Christmas presents so the good news can be shared with children in other countries. And we aren't just limited to work within our congregation. We can work with other churches on projects like CityServe to repair homes and fix properties throughout our whole region. We can fill the bellies of hungry children all year long when we serve with other churches and other organizations. And we can unite with other Methodists for global projects like African University or reduce, reducing death from malaria. Some of us are storytellers and inviters. And we can see where God is at work in the world. And we can tell others about it. We can see that others need God's love and we can, Christ's abundant life, and we can boldly invite them to a picnic, to a worship service, to a small group, or to any one of our many, many ministries. We invite others to experience God's love with us so that they can come to know the Spirit's restoration possibilities for themselves. When Jesus told those first disciples to go and make disciples, 
he was commissioning them to a brand new project. It had never been done before. He didn't say, go back to your synagogue and share my interpretation of the scriptures with the people of your faith. He didn't say, just go back to your jobs as changed and better people. The world was just as messy then as it is now. And he commissioned those 11 imperfect disciples to go out into that mess and use the power of compassion and healing ministry and inclusive community and life-giving words to change the world, to make God's kingdom known among the people of their faith, of other faiths, and of no faith. Those disciples did their job well. And now it is our turn. We are beloved children of God. We are disciples of Christ, commissioned to help others become disciples too. We are called to be disciples that make disciples. And we are better together. Amen. Amen.